I like to smile. I smile as often as I want to, which often makes people wonder what I think. Sometimes, when I'm concentrating hard, my smile runs off my face and into my brain to help. This is usually when some douchebag I've never met before decides my expression isn't good enough for him. Smile and the world smiles with you. Oh, but he won't do the smiling. Somehow, I have to do the emotional labor for both of us. Cheer up, girl. If he said hello and smiled at me in the first place, I'd probably return the greeting gladly. Hey, lady, smile for me. Perhaps the most annoying are those who tell me to smile when I'm already smiling. <laughs> Do they even look at me before ordering me around? Turn that frown upside down. One day at work, I was handing a lollipop to a toddler, laughing and smiling, when a man came out of nowhere and pounded his fist on my desk. Smile! Last week, Someone told me if I didn't smile at absolutely everyone, I will be responsible for the suicides of especially fragile people. Guilt trip much? Smile, baby. Perk up, honey. It's nearly always men who tell women to smile. I guess men's faces actually belong to men. We should redefine orders to smile as sexist street harassment, along with wolf whistles and hey babies and stranger butt grabs. It's not a compliment. It's not mere attraction. It's not a guy thing. Refusing to carry an umbrella is a guy thing. <laughs> they want to see me as a good girl, always cheerful and bubbly, soothing the woes that only they have. Let me cater to them endlessly. Make me a coy customer server of cheer, a marionette for them to manipulate. And I'll do it with a smile on my face. <laughs> Thank you, I am Skylark Bruce, and that is the reason why my face is mine. <laughs> All right, uh, last year at a couple of the Writing Night shows, uh, for National Poetry Month in April, we had a whole lot of people. And then in May, we had a whole lot of people who were completely different than the people before. So I wrote this poem. None of these people are the same. None of last month's enthused horde came back today. So they couldn't have been that passionate. Flamed up for a moment, but nothing ongoing a seedling that blew away at the first wind. Even the stray cat's poop by my back door takes longer to wash away in the rain. None of those April poetry fans have returned in May, like pale people who think maybe they should try to be white allies only during Black History Month, like neurotypical people who treat autistic kids and adults badly until they see a blue puzzle piece. Like men who spout feminism until it means shut up, women are talking. Like cisgender people who gladly support handsome trans men and stunningly gorgeous trans women, but be a genderqueer person who doesn't fit shiny box A or shiny box B, and they are squicked out. So come to Writing Nights events, or don't, but don't half ass dismantling the system. There is no kind of sort of when you're examining your privilege. There is no sometimes when death is on the line. There is no I don't feel into it when you have the power to preserve life. There just isn't. You don't toss a few marshmallows to a drowning person. You don't tell someone starving that they are hungry in the wrong month. Mm. You don't rip a coat off a shivering person and blame them for the hypothermia they fear. None of these people are the same, nor should they be, and nor should we be. We cannot usher in change when we won't let it in the door. So lots of people love music, but have you ever thought
thought about what music thinks of you. We evolved from birds, you and I. We came up through their throats with a hoo hoo and a chickadee dee. We are flesh and musical tone. Some tried to separate us in bits of militarism, religious zeal, or apathy. When your children are born, I'm the lullaby, say goodnight. Before they can say good morning, I am manamana, do 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 do. I train children to remember. One, two, buckle my shoe, and that this is the song that never ends. Grade schoolers all fall to pieces. Fatty, fatty, two by four. Mothers kiss away falling tears and hug whisper soothing ballads. How much do I love you? We are conjoined, never parted. You filled me with silly clowning. Let me tell your enduring love and grimace in your heart-strung grief. I have cherished you, your voices and interweaving instruments, swelling breath upon breath, mingling hydrogen and oxygen in treble and bass. Celebration! I am Willow River movement in your guided meditation. When you cannot lift up your head for the weight of singing loss, I am the somber, reverent dirge, carrying you through life's sorrow. This is the song that never ends. Through all of this, I held you up while daily you drag me down. I desire to disown you. I would slice away and sever your clenched unholy vocal cords from my measures and melodies. No onslaught of optimism. I clinked in the chains of another carnage, each bloody note dragged in the dirt with the corpses you called other. When you filled me with ignorance and your dagger-headed hatred, I so longed to be rid of you. You goaded your young sisters to dance to the beats of their own degradation. You made your black brothers eat strange fruit with strange ropes and coils. You ignored your wield, blinded, deaf. I bear the weight of my own sound. I recall each generation, their haunting chants and grim echoes. This is the song that never ends. Justice, not countless choruses. It is all too familiar. I would wrest my rhythm from you if my death would end your bloodshed. This is the song that never ends. We came from the birds, you and I. Anymore, I wish I had stayed in the sweet song of the sparrow. bathroom bill requires people to use the toilet that matches the gender they were assigned at birth. Bathroom bills should be about the cost of toilet paper, not who to exclude from the right to relieve oneself. North Carolina should mean fun and sun and begging industry. It should not be a synonym for UTIs. Bathrooms should be a place of release not paranoia and enforced gender presentation. Bathroom Bill should be a naughty cousin of Buffalo. Bathroom Billy Bob, Jake Tino's how to be a man, until a man com com comes constructed with two X chromosomes and a phenotype he doesn't recognize. Then he becomes Bathroom Boy. Bathroom Billy Maze would sell us the occasional option of family bathrooms, safe, legal, and far too rare. Bathroom bills shower attention on those who yearn not to be noticed. Bathroom bills give nosy cisgender people license to snoop the next stall and then squawk about protecting children. Bathroom bills mistake strangers in public places for a bigger threat to kids than stepdad, uncle, cousin. Bathroom bills mistake transgender victims of violence for those who bloodily enforce the binary. Bathroom bills put the self-inflicted gunshot into genderqueer teens. Bathroom bills make such a comfortable casket liner. Bathroom bills lower us six feet down. Bathroom bills hold up the mirror. Bathroom bills show us how much we still owe.
starting to write poetry about seven odd years ago. It took me six months to write anything worth reading. So for those of you who are starting out and you're writing and you're writing and nothing is really all that fabulous, that's fine, keep writing. Luis Isumadre. He wrapped his fingers around my neck, screaming. He dug his grubby nails into my sweaty skin, pleading not to let him go. The desperate outburst from the year and a half old child in my, in my arms erupted because he glimpsed his mother. His mother, su madre, who we believed to be abusing him or looking the other way while someone else did. The belt mark. Oh, the belt mark. Raised welts on the boy's back in the cruel outline of a large metal buckle. Luis arrived at the daycare as a new admission that morning. And on the first diaper change, my coworker discovered the bruising. He slept on my lap most of the day. I wanted to hold him forever, keep him away from every terror. In Bolivia, Children's Services does very little. They place abandoned children in orfanatos and not much else. The daycare director said she would meet with the mother when she came to pick up Luis. One, two, three, four o'clock. The hours never marched forward so fast before. Beep! Let up the Luis! The intercom summons I dreaded all day. I carefully gathered Luis's few threadbare belongings into his stained backpack. Bailamos! Urged the Santa Cruz sunbeams. Let's dance and we'll soothe his pain. I contemplated taking a circuitous route through the playground in the implausible hope that a minute more away from his mother would amount to something. But I just walked slowly. When Luis saw his mother, he clung to my neck and began to wail. I froze, trying not to run away and take him with me. I was prepared for me to despise this woman upon meeting her, but mi Dios, what daily terrors has she been serving him? All the other kids run happily to their parents. I bent down to stand Luis on the floor. He kicked his legs back and forth, tightening his grip and crying, No! 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 I turned to the director, Lucy, and she reached out to take him. I pried his fingers loose from my neck, easing him into her arms, and then the hardest moment of all, turning my back and walking out of that room. I tried to tell myself that Lucy would handle everything, but I knew she couldn't do much. Her hands were bound by parish favoring laws and public officials who minded nothing but bribes. If ever there was a country whose children needed los politicos on their side, it was Bolivia. My wooden feet could barely carry me to the closest bathroom, despite my quivering lower lip and welling eyes. I felt hollow, in the thick fever. After my emotional release, I tamped my heart back down and returned to the toddler room, where 15 more Boliviano children waited for their parents. I appreciated those parents more now, for despite their flaws, they cared for their children. I prayed Luis's mother would learn from them. Muy, muy rápido. All right, so my uh, humorous interlude here it comes from a text message I received on the way here. <laughs> my friend's phone was repeating things in the uh, Dr. Seuss-like manner. So he says, sorry, sorry, my phone is a little messed up, a little messed up, a little messed up. I am loading, I am loading sauces and pans, I am loading sauces and pans and lids, I am loading sauces and pans and lids, I am loading sauces and pans and lids and crackers, and I am loading sauces and pans and crackers and lids, and I am loading sauces and pans and crackers and lids and a whole bunch of stuff. I am loading sauces and pans and lids and crackers and a whole bunch of stuff for you guys and will and will and will bring it down and will bring it down 
Sunday, and we'll bring it down Sunday a.m. LOL, talk about autocorrect. Have fun, folks. I don't notice the juice dribbling down my chin. I have been waiting all day to peel back the layers and bury my face into this orange. Anticipation heightens every sense, and I'm ready, so ready. I pull back the outer layer, expecting the promised taste, and then whack! Bitter, tough. Chewy lining, the meager juice munches sourly down my chin. This intruder caught me completely unaware, unsuspecting in my enticement. The betrayal. The betrayal of a dry orange. Dry oranges come from grocery stores, roadside stands, and sometimes churches. The dry orange religious pretenders talk of spiritual ecstasy so sweet that listeners may not notice their own saliva dripping down their chins. It's so easy, they promise. Repeat after me, and God will bless you. Oh, it smells so good. Just let me sink my teeth into it. As they spray the crowd with orange-scented air freshener. These simple steps are the only way to God, the citrus preachers promise. Give your money to me that God's work continues. Mandarin memories seep in around the doors and windows of my mind. Jesus loves you, so you have to do what I say. My tongue trembles for tangerine. They prop themselves up as gatekeepers, doormen in the house of God. They assure us that spiritual bliss is a few memorized Bible verses away and put the blame on their followers when paints by numbers faith doesn't pan out. To many, they smell as tantalizing as a box of Spanish mandarins, but inside, they disappoint like the betrayal of a dry orange. <clears throat> no one needs a secret key to commune with God or an introducer to explore the divine mysteries. Listening to the sacred can be as simple as sitting silently. Maybe your understanding of God is more like a peach or an apple. And oranges, however sweet they can be, leave you nauseated. Don't believe a religious con polishing a capricious citrus. Find the fruit of your faith. To us as frightened puppets, each of us paying over and over. Their scam has run its course. We know the good news in each cell of our bodies. It has nothing to do with blood washing or obedience to a highly variable code. God has hidden God's self in the last place many would think to look, inside of us. Original sin lied to us, constructed a torturous narrative, and convinced most people to live fear into existence. But the mystics knew. 
the mystics recognized the face of God in each of us. They, they saw through the illusion that holy and human are separate, when in fact, we never stopped being love. The institution used words like heretic, false prophet, witch, and sinner to condemn those they could not control. But we are love, each of us, whether we feel empowered or not, we are the embodiment of the divine. Sin is not doing bad things. It's any perception that separates us from knowing that God is in us and we are in God. We are love. They said that Jesus is fully human and fully divine. What, he, what they left out is, so are we. There is no angry God who must be appeased by a sacrifice to the death. There is only the spirit who longs for each one to know our true intended nature. We are not going to hell. We may create a hell for each other, but we also have the power to know each other. The divine in me recognizes the divine in you. How absurd that this notion seems Eastern instead of native to everywhere. So no, sweetheart, you're not going to hell. You cannot lose God's love because it is not conditional, no matter what they said. Now go and be loved, because love is who you are. Right, one last piece, um, what I want to point out first, the uh, octopi that Michael mentioned earlier, some of them have a cute little way to hang them up. Some of them have the uh, antique buttons that my great-grandmother collected. So there's a whole bunch right over here on the table. How much are they? Okay, so the majority of them are $7, but the one that is also a Ninja Turtle is $8. Uh, all right. You've heard it 7,503 times, but thankfully not yet tonight. A performer shakes the stage with their incredible essence. The next person on the mic squeaks out, How can I possibly follow that? And the audience is sure they can't. How you follow that is by owning your truth, by speaking with your voice and raising your reason. We must stop constructing false quotas. If so-and-so tonight was great, then no one else will measure up. We can be blown away by more than one performer at a time. And nor is the audience a monolith. I'm sure someone was unimpressed with the one before. So you follow that by following your soul down the path only it knows. You follow that by making this night an ongoing, continuous revelation of truth shared by many mouths. You follow that. You follow that. You don't shrink away and diminish your own glimmer. You just witness awesomeness. How dare you let that dim your sparkle? You follow that. Because you are the only one who can.